Welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Jordan Syatt, and in this podcast, I have the honor of speaking with Musab Hassan Youssef, who is a Palestinian born in the West Bank, and his father, Sheikh Hassan Youssef, is one of the co-founders of Hamas. Now, Musab, as you'll see here in a minute, served in Hamas, and later he was brought to Israeli prison, and he served several years in Israeli prison. And while he was there, he saw and learned not just about the horrors Hamas was committing against innocent Israelis, but also about the horrors and atrocities Hamas was committing against its own people, innocent civilians, and even its own members. And through doing that, he learned that Hamas is not what he had been told it was. And as a result of it, he ended up switching sides. And he became a spy for the Israeli Shin Bet, and he spied on Hamas for many years. And now... Musab Hassan Youssef is an outspoken advocate on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict trying to educate people on the truth, and I am fortunate enough and blessed enough to speak with Musab today, and I'm very excited to share this interview with you. Now, before we begin, there are a few things I want to briefly go over with you before we get into the interview. First and foremost, if you want to know more about Musab and his story, I strongly encourage you to get his book called Son of Hamas. It goes over his entire life story, starting from his childhood all the way to him serving in Hamas and all the things he went through there, his time in Israeli prison, and then his time actually working for the Israeli Shin Bet, spying on Hamas for them. Second, and with that in mind, this podcast focuses more on Hamas, the Palestinian government in Gaza, as well as the Israeli government and each of these respective governments' goals. The reason I wanted to speak with Musab, or one of the many reasons, is because he is potentially the only person in the world who has worked with both governments. And he is the only one who is able to truly say what the goals of these governments are. He knows what they do, he knows what their intent is, and he knows why they do certain things. And I think that when we're looking at a situation as complex and as difficult as the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, we need to understand what are the goals of each of these governments. Because the reality is, most citizens on both sides want peace. And right now what we're being what we're being shown on social media are horrific things and people are pointing fingers and blaming and we're becoming desensitized to watching citizens on both sides be killed. And we need to understand what's going on at the governmental level. And I couldn't think of a single person better to discuss this than someone like Musab who has served in Hamas who has close ties to Hamas and has also served in the Israeli Shin Bet and has served in the government level. Now, with that in mind, I understand this is social media and people love to be offended and upset. And if you find yourself getting upset at something that Musab is saying, take into consideration that odds are he probably knows more than you about this situation. And if you're getting upset, there's a chance that potentially you have been influenced by propaganda. You have been influenced by something that is not accurate. And considering Musab has very high level intelligence about Hamas and very high level intelligence about Israel and their government, there's a really strong chance that he knows more about this than you and is well aware of what both sides are doing. So if you notice yourself getting upset, challenge that. Sit with it. Don't jump to write a mean comment on social media sit with it and consider maybe there's something for you to learn. Finally, I am not a geopolitical expert, nor am I a political commentator. I am a fitness coach. I help people with strength training and nutrition and fat loss and developing a healthier relationship with food, which ironically, off air, when we finished recording, Masab and I spoke about a fair bit, and he wants to come back on another time and talk about his fitness and nutrition, but that's a topic for a separate day. So I will say, if you would like to uh, subscribe to my YouTube, subscribe to my podcast to learn more about health and fitness and nutrition, please do, because that's what 99.9% .9 of my content on all platforms is. But 
I am very passionate about this specific topic, and I want to figure out ways to help reach peace, not just in the Middle East, but all over the world. And I very much believe that I am very blessed, and God has given me an opportunity to reach people because I have an audience, and hopefully I'll be able to spread more positive, uplifting voices that are trying to achieve peace all over the world and have difficult conversations. Because I very much believe that the only way we can achieve peace is through open dialogues and having difficult conversations. So if you want more fitness information, please subscribe to my podcast. Please subscribe to my YouTube, my Instagram, all of that stuff. But with that being said, let's get into this unbelievable conversation I had with the one and only Musab Hassan Youssef. Musab Hassan Youssef, how are you, my friend? Very good, brother. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming on. Uh, Like I was saying before we hit record, I appreciate you immensely. I am a, a huge fan of yours. I've recommended your book, The Son of Hamas, to uh, everyone who follows me. Uh, it's you, You've you changed my life, and I think it's fair to say that you've changed the world in many ways. So uh, thank you so much for coming on. And um, I have everything written down. I'm, I'm looking at the side because I have a lot of stuff written down. And basically, I want to give you a quick overview of what I would like to cover in our conversation today. Um, so first... I want to get to know you and your background. Second, I want to learn about Hamas as well as innocent Palestinian civilians. Third, I want to learn about your thoughts on Israel as well as innocent Israeli civilians. And then finally, I'm going to want to know your thoughts on coming to a resolution and whether or not that's even possible. So I have a lot of questions. I I want to be very respectful of your time. So hopefully we can get through all of them, but I understand that you have, you're a very busy man. So if you can't, I understand. Um, but with all of that being said, let's jump right into the first question, which is, Mosab, who are you? Where are you from? Why and and why are you a trustworthy source of information for people when it comes to understanding the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Well, this is a very uh, a complicated uh, and broad question. <laughs> yeah, I know, uh, I know. But I, I I will do my best. I will do my best. Uh, especially, you know, I I left the region many years ago, and uh, I have changed my life so many times. Uh, every time I build a life, uh, I'm forced somehow to demolish it and mm. start over from scratch. And I have done this dozens of times <laughs> over the past uh, 20, 25 years. Um, so it's very hard for me to actually say that uh, this is what I am, this is who I am, uh, this is what, because I'm not what I do. Uh, but in general, uh, I was born in the West Bank uh, back in 1978 uh, to a Muslim Palestinian uh, family. Uh, my father uh, helped found Hamas movement that was back in 1987. I grew up uh, during the first Palestinian Intifada. Um, I witnessed the violence on the streets. Uh, I attended the mosque. Uh, My family was very religious family. They are still very religious family. So Islam uh, played a big uh, part of my early conditioning. Uh, Then I became the Islamic student president uh, at our school. Uh, I went to a Sharia school as well. I went to a secular school. Uh, I uh, obtained a degree uh, major in history and geography. Uh, Then uh, I spent uh, years in Israeli prison. And that was part of my uh, Hamas activity, uh, Islamic movement activity, and just the fact that I was the oldest son of one of the founders of Hamas in and out prison. While I was in prison uh, back in 1996, I witnessed Hamas brutality, firsthand brutality, uh, torturing people, killing people, um and i start questioning the movement so this is in general uh just the let's say the milestones of my journey 
Uh, but what actually made me depart from Hamas is not just a one event uh, or a turning point. Uh, as I recall, since childhood, the gap or the distance between me and Hamas uh, widened. Until now, as you see, there, there are galaxies between us. Um, and of course, we will cover you know, what I did and what I didn't do and what I think of uh, everything that is going on. Makes total sense. Thank you. And um, what I'll do is I'll put the link to your book, Son of Hamas, in the description of the podcast, as well as in the YouTube uh, in the show notes, because I recommend it to everyone. And it's an extraordinary book. And it will give much more in-depth insight into your individual story. Um, the next question I have for you, Musab, is... Can you explain what Hamas is and what its goal is and what it does for both the Palestinian people as well as Israel? Hamas was established with one goal, to, to build an Islamic state on the rubble of the state of Israel. Uh, and their state is a global state uh, because Hamas is not uh, an independent organization. Hamas belongs to the mother organization, the Muslim Brotherhood from mm -hmm. Egypt Syria, okay. and throughout the region. They have more than uh, 100 million active members worldwide, the biggest wow. Islam movement. And the Muslim Brotherhood gave birth to Al Qaeda, gave birth to uh, Abdullah Azam, to uh, Bin Laden, to uh, uh, many of their disciples. They all got inspired by Hassan al Banna and Sayyid Qutb. Those are the two uh, main philosophers uh, behind the ideology of the Muslim Brotherhood. So Hamas is part of that camp. Uh, and uh, their charter is very clear that Hamas, uh, Palestine, or Hamas, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, Palestine uh, has a goal, and that is the destruction of the state of Israel. Uh, then after that, uh, to establish an Islamic state. Uh, but the main goal for the Muslim Brotherhood is to expand from Egypt, from the Palestinian territories, from Jordan, Syria, the rest of the Arab world into Turkey and expand to Europe. Uh, so it's not a secret that this is the goal of the Muslim Brotherhood of Hamas organization. And they are big. They are big. They are powerful. And this is why we're disturbed of what happened in Gaza. Uh, because this is, if, if there will be a victory, this is not the victory only of Hamas as a small group of uh, militia. Uh, we are talking about the victory of the Muslim Brotherhood ideology. And if they score in Gaza... We have a big problem worldwide. We're already feeling it. Can you explain a little bit in more detail what, what does that look like? What does that big problem look like? Let's just assume it, they let's assume they achieve their goal. What do, what happens to the world as we know it? Hmm. Uh, I don't mean to spread panic because I think we are strong and uh, but their attempt to conquer the West, to dominate the Western civilization and this is something not new they tried very hard uh, throughout the centuries um, and their dream uh, got suspended by the collapse of the Ottoman Empire in the past century uh, right after the uh, World War I. And uh, since then, uh, this monster uh, had been asleep. Uh, today, what we are witnessing, it's awakening. It's awakening. Uh, I think the best Islamists can do, someone who actually knows their mentality very well, what they stand for, uh, their strength and their weaknesses, and most importantly, their delusion. Uh, uh, their psychology. I guarantee you that they cannot conquer the globe. They don't have that capacity. Uh, they don't have a plan. 
uh, for uh, their uh, hypothetical uh, form of state, global state. It's just very similar to the Nazi ambition of uh, conquering the globe. Uh, so I doubt that they can achieve this goal, but in the meantime, they can create lots of chaos. Got they it. are capable of uh, uh, destroying order. They're very good at that. And uh, what's happening in Gaza right now, just an example of how they have uh, challenged uh, Israel as democracy. Before it's mm -hmm. a Jewish uh, nation as a democracy. Um, uh, th this type of groups, they thrive in chaos. This is why they love chaos. They love bloodshed. Uh, they love confusion. Uh, they love division. Uh, when it's chaotic, they thrive. Uh, they uh, they take over. Uh, when there is order, they die. They shrink. Uh, th this is their quality. If I want to go more details, we're talking about a migrant problem in Europe, for example. Huge percentage of um, people crossed through the Mediterranean uh, into Europe. Uh, they don't believe in the principles of the Western civilization. They brought with them their cultures and their religion, and they are uh, basically, uh, they want to see it uh, Islamic. And uh, there are Europeans who converted to Islam, and it is the uh, fastest growing religion uh, in the world. So uh, to look at the bigger picture, yes, this is what I'm talking about, that we have a problem, um, uh, migration problem in Europe, uh, cultural differences, and uh, you can say a clash um, between Islamists and uh, the rest of the world who uh, believe in freedom, equality, uh, women uh, rights, etc. Uh, so uh, the danger about uh, this type of group that they uh, don't believe in the diversity of life, uh, they don't believe in dialogue, they don't believe in democracy uh, of the political process, uh, respecting the other opinion where, you know, the de defeated uh, in uh, in an election uh, would have to respect the choice of the majority, um, etc. All, all the things that uh, made the West into uh, the great example that we are living today. So it's, uh, we have some fundamental problems uh, and uh, in the short term, I think we, we just need to realize that if we don't fight against Islamists, who especially those who are using violence, mm -hmm. uh, like Hamas, um, and the impact of their uh, strategy to target civilians, uh, then then we have, we have a problem. They could spread uh, like a wildfire. And this is what we don't want to allow to happen. Makes total sense. Um... Moving a little bit towards what a lot of people are seeing now in the current situation, um, one thing that we hear a lot about in the news is that Hamas uses citizens as human shields. And I want to clarify this once and for all. Um, does Hamas actually use its citizens as human shields? Uh, if yes, can you explain what does that practically mean? Do they conduct military operations from hospitals and schools and residential buildings hoping for their civilians to be killed? And if they do that, why do they do that? Well, first of all, this is not uh, the only crime Hamas uh, just committed. That this is not the only thing. Uh, Hamas committed a much greater crime that cannot be forgotten or forget forgiven. Uh, and that was October 7th. Their mm -hmm. attack on the southern communities of Israel um, first of all, that was not their first uh, tar uh, target against civilians, because Hamas for many years carried suicide bombing attacks since their establishment, killing thousands of people, uh, mostly Israeli people, but also Americans died, for example, uh, as part of our counter uh, terrorism effort uh, to capture the terrorists who blew up the Hebrew University. Six Americans were killed in that attack. Uh, Hamas did not differentiate between Israelis, Europeans, uh, including Israeli Arabs and Israeli Arab Muslims uh, who were also killed in those attacks. So Hamas uh, has a long history before uh, we arrived at October 7th 
But what make, made October 7 different than their brutality in the past is the scale of the, uh, of the attack that uh, uh, qualifies uh, at, uh, at the level of a genocide, actually more than a genocide by all definitions. If you look at the footage captured by Hamas themselves and what they did uh, moving from door to door, annihilating everything in their way, killing people in their living rooms and ethnically cleansing everything in their way, raping, destroying, uh, blowing things up. It's uh, a modern day genocide. This is what a genocide is. And I, I could not believe that uh, after watching the massacre uh, represented by the IDF at the United Nations, uh, my life will never be the same. It's not even the Hamas that I knew for many years growing up in the Middle East. They became something uh, a pure embodiment of evil. And that's the difference uh, of uh, what Hamas became and the difference between the victims of October 7, which basically victims of a genocide. There is no doubt about it. Sooner or later, there would be investigation into what ex exactly happened. And uh, any uh, rational mind will come to this conclusion that what happened was not a terrorist attack uh, committed by, let's say, uh, political hatred from uh, some fanatic uh, uh, terrorists who targeted civilians. That happened in the case of the IRA and many other terrorist organizations. It happened also by Hamas in the past, but their attack this time, that was not, it was a lot worse than what we witnessed ISIS doing to civilians and to humanity. Wow. Hence, hence we are talking about first Hamas uh, crime is a genocide. Then the second crime come uh, the use of human shields, that uh, it's a fact that they use their own people. After the attack, they escaped, uh, hid, in tunnels, under hospitals, schools, mosques, uh, the, one of the most populated areas on earth, the Gaza Strip, a huge uh, refugee camp. And they used uh, mosques, schools, uh, other public institutions uh, as lunch, uh, missile launching pads, uh, misfiring many times. And uh, like, for example, Al Ma'madani uh, hospital incident, that was a Hamas misfire that killed uh, dozens, possibly hundreds of people. Uh, so it's not only using the people as human shields, but also hiding uh, under the city and using uh, a, what's supposed to be a shelter designated by the United Nations, which in the case of Gaza, mostly were the schools. So Hamas knew beforehand that the schools are going to be a safe place where Israel cannot target them. So they use them as launching pads. So we're talking about uh, multi-layer, uh, sophisticated evil, unheard of, unheard of, that you go commit genocide, then you run super fast and hide behind children and women wanting the bloodshed to happen and where children uh, and innocent people die. So you can uh, make your enemy suffer uh, a public assassination. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the whatever, you know, the, the uh, civilian casualties will make the, the world blame Israel, uh, delegitimize uh, Israel as a democracy. In the meantime, Hamas would get legitimacy and become uh, uh, even. So Hamas saying, hey, we're not the terrorists. Israel is terrorist. And when the world condemn Israel continuously, while they fail to, uh, to con condemn Hamas, you see that this is the game that Hamas uh, learned how to play very well in the past four or five wars with Israel. And every time they learned the trick uh, and they developed a greater lust for blood, like a monster. When it smells blood, it becomes very aggressive. If it tastes blood, they, it wants just to attack the puree even harder. Uh, and this is the Hamas monster we are talking about. And I'm not making it up. This is exactly, there is, this is, could be like the best picture you can draw such savages. But it, it did not end there. 
they took infants, children, innocent civilians as hostages with demand to release mass murderers from Israeli prisons in return to infants and put them back on the streets. So with that said, Hamas committed three major crimes, war crimes that are unheard of. You know, we heard about genocide. We saw some genocide uh, uh, movies, etc. But but what what happened in reality just less than two months ago? It was a very dark day uh, of humanity. There's a lot there. Thank you for explaining all of that. Uh, and we'll go over some more of the things that you said. One of the things I just wanted to discuss, shocking as it is, I've seen many people essentially denying the claims that Hamas committed these crimes uh, on October 7th. Y you said you saw the videos of it in, uh, in, at the United Nations. Um, what would you say to people who are, all, whether they're in the United States or the United Kingdom or Canada, wherever they're, what would you say to people who are denying these claims, who are saying, no, they didn't do that. No, that didn't happen. Like, what, what would you tell them? Many people uh, choose to be in denial. And this does not change uh, the truth, does, does not change the facts on the ground. Uh, any of those people, if they saw uh, Hamas uh, self-documented uh, footage, videos, uh, cell phones, whatever they did, it's just mind-blowing uh, what we had to witness. And by the way, many of this was even filtered that was not available to uh, completely to see what they did on October 7th. So the people who are in denial, uh, they have some interest in that. They, they want to, uh, they profit from this confusion, or I would say uh, the, the admitting that uh, Hamas is a savage group, not a national group, uh, would uh, get them out of their comfort zone. Uh, their comfort mm -hmm. zone is they want to be, they want Hamas to be just a counterpart. They want to see a two-state solution. They want to see just people uh, getting along. But it's not black and white. And it is not uh, as simple and as easy as they want it to be. Uh, and it's very easy to uh, blame uh, one side, especially that many people view Israel uh, as the superior power. And they think that Hamas uh, punch of uh, uh, revolution members, and they, they are the underdog, they are the Chi Jivaras, they are freedom fighters, and uh, hence uh, we support this uh, minority against the uh, uh, capitalists, Zionists. Uh, so everybody, many people had their opportunity to express their uh, anti-Semitism mm -hmm. uh, uh, and their hatred, basically, uh, against the uh, wealthy elite uh, and uh, by just supporting Hamas. It's a, it's a way that they try to mock Israel, to mock the Jewish people. But I'm not sure that this is a healthy approach to the problem because they are only making things uh, worse. Makes total sense. Um, you mentioned the the Israeli hostages, even the infants, eight months old, nine months old, Kfir, uh, number of the of the hostages. I wanted to. I have a question about that. Um, I wrote Hamas has Israeli hostages, including innocent babies, children, women, and elderly people they kidnapped out of their homes on October seventh. Israel also has many Palestinian prisoners that some people say are innocent children. Uh, you said they were mass murderers. Um, you've been in Israeli prison. Uh, does Israel have innocent Palestinians held captive? Or are the Palestinians in Israeli prisons actually criminals? And how does Israel treat its prisoners versus how does Hamas treat its prisoners? Um. There is no one that can stay one hour in Israeli prison if there is no uh, uh, order from court, from a judge. And uh, there is no innocent uh, person in Israeli prisons. Uh, all 
Palestinian prisoners are convicted. There is a small minority, and those are not children. Uh, those are the most sophisticated security uh, prisoners, like the military wing, the very tough guys that basically uh, Israel has, let's say, secret files on them through intelligence. Like I was in a situation like this, where basically uh, I brought these people to justice, knowing their intention, their plan, but Israel could not provide the source to the judge. Because if they uh, say that the Green Prince, that was my code name in the uh, operation, uh, gave the information, uh, it could lead uh, to expose me. So this type of uh, individuals, and they are not many, we're talking about a couple of hundred uh, at the time, that Israel has uh, intelligence about their invol direct involvement of uh, high profile terrorist attacks, but they could not convict them uh, in a court of law and sentence them. So what they do, they put them under the administrative detention mm. uh, for let's say six months uh, to make sure that they are uh, not on the streets uh, carrying some terrorist attacks or plotting planning uh, terrorist attacks. So with that said, this could be like the, the only area where somebody might attack Israel. It's like, yes, you, you have people in prison who are not convicted, uh, but Israel simply has the conviction but cannot reveal the source where they brought the information. It's, it's part of their um, uh, cover for the, the, the source. And again, those are less than 2%, not even a 1% of the total prisoners in Israel prisons. Uh, there are underage prisoners, but those are ones who tried to, to uh, stab somebody. So you have maybe a 16 or 17 year old kid, but had at some point a knife or a gun and tried to shoot or stab somebody. So Israel cannot just simply say, oh, because you are 16 year old, uh, you can kill someone. So those are in prison, yes, but uh, Israel does not uh, arrest. Palestinian children who are not convicted, uh, not 100 percent, but 1 million percent. Uh, anything out, out of this, uh, it would be uh, Palestinian propaganda would be simply a lie. Makes total sense. Actually, I saw uh, Gigi Hadid made a, a post about how in his, Israel takes innocent Palestinian children and and then she actually had to remove it and take it down because the the child that she was referring to there was video of him trying to stab multiple Israelis. He actually, I believe he stabbed an Israeli mother with her children and then they put him in prison. And, and she said he was innocent until she, she found out that, oh, he wasn't actually innocent. So it is helpful to get your clarification on that. And who the hell is Gigi Hadid? She's, uh, honestly, I didn't know about her until all, all, all of this, like since I started getting involved in this stuff, but she is uh, many millions of followers and, she uh she's I see, I see. yeah doesn't matter she's a social media superstar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's exactly right um okay so let's see i have a number of other questions on this on this specific topic okay so here's another uh very important question um i don't think a lot of people have heard about this and i want your clarification on it does hamas have a pay for slay program uh, this is another thing we hear a lot about uh, on the news, and I think this is vitally important to know when it comes to speaking about Hamas. Um, is the pay for slay program real? Uh, and if it is, what is it? Look, Hamas' uh, biggest weapon is not money. It's the power of uh, idea. And uh, especially when there is an idea about some other life, a promise not in this life, but in the afterlife. Mm. Uh, and uh, when you have, uh, when you are political, religious, ideological, national, uh, you have uh, movement, you have so many uh, ways to manipulate the human mind and misguide it into uh, this type of rabbit holes where there is no end uh, to their matrix and how they trap youngsters uh, to serve them. 
uh, actually believing that uh, through bloodshed you are pleasing Allah. And that's, there is nothing worse than this combination. When you take someone who's, let's say, uh, in principle, have some political hatred towards Israel, um, maybe some na nationalism or devotion to something, and then you add to that, say, hey, and if you die in the uh, afterlife, uh, there are promises of uh, infinite life, infinite pleasure. Uh, there is no pain there. Uh, you uh, please Allah uh, by uh, committing suicide, by shedding your own blood. And uh, there is no higher uh, mean of worship than jihad. This is their ideology. So now, uh, there are many escapists in, in bad economy, in poverty, coming from refugee camps, uh, filled with hatred. Like right now, you look at Gaza, and there is a whole generation uh, that hate Israel. But they, instead of, like, for example, hating Hamas for using them as uh, human shields. And unfortunately, uh, youngsters, they don't have the power of discernment, and they don't have... Uh, I mean, it took me how many years to break out of Hamas bondage and uh, their conditioning, uh, the Islamic conditioning. I had to fight the good fight for many, many years to reshape myself uh, and break free uh, from such uh, a delusion. It was so hard. It was uh, the, the process was dying again and again and again on a regular basis, dying to everything I learned uh, where I was able to actually escape that uh, that matrix. So uh, the, the uh, challenge for many members of Hamas was like how to die, how to let go of the national identity, uh, religious identity, all the false identities and find uh, who they are. Uh, and that's where it gets risky because it means uh, you let go of your security, you get out of your comfort zone, you walk into the unknown, most likely your family would uh, shun you, uh, and there is a chance you get killed in the process. And this is the fear that everyone has to deal with. So it's it's better for them actually uh, to stay in their imprisonment, pleasing uh, the uh, religious institution, uh, religious authorities, uh, having uh, the uh, public image as nationalists, as uh, those who sacrifice for the country. Uh, and uh, if they die, uh, they die in honor and glory, hoping that uh, the promise of the afterlife will be fulfilled. Uh, in the meantime, if they, they can also profit, uh, the, the Hamas would give them money, would give them funds. But money is not only Hamas uh, game. It's a lot more complicated than uh, just uh, money. If you want to take, for example, what they did on October 7, they said everyone who bring a hostage uh, uh, on the way back uh, to Gaza after their attack, they would take $10,000 and an apartment. This is substantial amount of money for Gazans. And wow. when you promise people that you get an apartment and $10,000 in cash means that you can start your life, you can build a family. And many of those uh, uh, savages went with lust uh, to to bring some hostages back. And this is why we have hundreds of hostages were captured on October 7 because of such a promise. Got it. Wow. Okay. So I, I actually, I didn't know that I, I had heard, but I, I wasn't sure that Hamas offered $10,000 for every hostage that they brought back. Okay. Mm -hmm. that, that's insane. That's um, why their confessions, I hear, I hear one of their confessions is what came out of their mouth when they were arrested. Wow. Yeah. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Um, are citizens in Gaza, innocent civilians, or 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 just citizens, are citizens in Gaza supportive of Hamas? Uh, and if they don't support Hamas, are they free to say so without fear of being hurt or killed? Is there freedom of speech? Are they allowed to do that even if they don't agree with them? Look, a majority of people voted for Hamas uh, back in 2006. Uh, this is how Hamas came uh, to power in Gaza. Uh, many of the Gazans support Hamas before the election. You know, Hamas has its own members, has many families, tribes, uh, entire communities that stand behind them. 
So there is a huge part of Gaza that support Hamas. Uh, then uh, there are enemies of Hamas because Hamas made many enemies in Gaza. But it looks like many of them are silent because of fear. And this does not take the responsibility away. Then there are others who cheering for Hamas out of hypocrisy because they're afraid that Hamas would still be in power tomorrow and Israel would fail their mission. So they are afraid what it will be like post, uh, let's say, war if Hamas still in power. Uh, so they don't want to, uh, to risk their future. And uh, there are sincere uh, supporters of Hamas and they are huge. What, what's in common between, let's say, this three major uh, classes of Gaza, if, if it's correct to say, uh, their hatred towards Israel. And that's where it's scary. It's not how many people in Gaza support Hamas as much, how many people in Gaza love Israel. Mm. And that's, that's what you find the majority of Gazans who actually hate Israel. Uh, and it's their delusion because there is no reason for them to hate Israel. Israel was nothing because their, their greatest enemy is Hamas, is their own governing authority. Uh, but take, take, for example, when, is, when Hamas brought the hostages back to Gaza, you could see thousands of people beating up hostages, cheering, celebrating. It's the same way they celebrated the 9-11 uh, attacks, very similar uh, picture. Um, and uh, many of the rapes that happened uh, on that day, October 7th, uh, Hamas attacked first. They did their atrocities, their ethnic cleansing, but then there was a second wave and a third wave of Gaza civilians who invaded those communities, looting, raping, oh, destroying. So many of the atrocities, the burning, many of the things that happened throughout that day, that sick day for many, many hours were committed by Gaza civilians. And this is what many people are not understanding this. In a society where they cannot condemn the savages, they agree with them, they cheer for them, then they have in common hatred towards Israel. What are we expecting when Israel is defending itself against a genocide, trying to prevent another event like this? In such a crazy Jewish trauma that throughout my life, I hear the story never again, never again, referring to the Holocaust, then all of a sudden it happened. And such a challenge for, I mean, the magnitude of Hamas attack on October 7th is just beyond war. It's beyond um, anyone's expectations. So the civilian casualties, if this is the point where you're trying to get, it's first of all on the hands of Hamas for using human shields. Second, Israel gave them uh, a warning to uh, evacuate northern Gaza, more than 21 days. What were they still doing in northern Gaza? Of course, they were given Hamas a cover. And in this case, they are partnering with Hamas. And if they mm -hmm. get hit, then this, this is not Israel to blame. Second, you need to think of it. When top Hamas leaders and Israel managed to uh, kill a bunch of them, so far, I mean, high profile. Hamas hid this for a long time, but uh, when the truth came to the picture, it was revealed. But now, why Israel supposed to uh, really uh, miss an opportunity to assassinate a top Hamas leader? Because for example, he was among his tribe, that his mm. tribe included civilians that there is actually his offspring there. So why Israel in, in such uh, an ugly scenario where there is a genocide committed against her? Why would they think, no, we cannot kill this high profile terrorist because we cannot harm his family? So in, in such a situation, 
um, it's it's not an easy war. It's a very, very ugly war. And you need to somehow rid of those people and people die in war. This is why Hamas should not, uh, should have not initiated that war. Now, uh, we come to another point. Uh, did actually, uh, or does Hamas uh, statistics about uh, civilian casualties in, in Gaza uh, count? Are, are they accountable? Are they legit, their numbers legitimate? It's the only source that we're getting the information. And the footage of civilian casualty, many of it is coming from Syria, many years before the Gaza war. And just Hamas put some tag on it that this is Gaza. But many of the children photos that we see, it's coming from Syria, from different regions, were killed uh, on the hands of Arab against Arab. But Hamas prepared for this propaganda prior to the war, knowing that they can send uh, wave shocks in the world and just turn the entire world against Israel. So Israel would cease fire and have to negotiate over hostages. This is what Hamas wanted, to go in, destroy, hurt Israel so bad, Israel retaliates, then Hamas uh, uh, force the world to condemn Israel and big for a ceasefire where Hamas get away with their crime, get legitimacy in the meantime. This is their game. So the civilian casualties, uh, I don't know if we will ever know actually how many people died in Gaza, but if we talk about one of the most populated area on earth, and if even if their statistic was correct, we say the magnitude of, uh, of a genocide on October 7th cannot be even compared to 100,000 dying in Gaza, because in Gaza, the victims are war victims, a very different than genocide victims. Genocide is the highest crime committed by humanity. There is nothing worse than that, especially when it includes raping, killing, burning, whatever it is, the ugliest acts savages can commit. Two, uh, civilian casualties happening uh, because of uh, being used as human shields, first of all. Second, in an ugly war that Israel has no uh, alternative. I don't know what Israel is supposed to do. Just send its children uh, to go and uh, uh, be vulnerable to all type of booby traps and uh, bombing and killing and stabbing on the hands of Gaza civilians, they call them. Uh, for example, we had one of the hostages. Just take this example. One of the hostages uh, managed to escape. He was dual uh, citizen, uh, Russian Israeli. He was captured at the party uh, on October 7th. He managed to escape for about four days. Then finally, civilians caught him and brought him back to Hamas uh, captivity. Mm -hmm. So uh, we cannot be weak. You know, this is supposed to be my supposed to be my people. But you know, if I go to Gaza, I will not survive a minute. And uh, I don't know how am I supposed to feel about this. I don't want the Gazan people to die. Uh, 10 years working with Israel undercover, uh, my intention was to never uh, target any civilian. And I did not have even any blood on my hands. Uh, but in the West Bank was completely different than Gaza, than this open war against savages. And sometimes it's inevitable. You know, look what the United States did in Hiroshima and Nagasaki when uh, Jap Japanese savages attacked Pearl Harbor, the United States realized that this is it. When they just became suicidal, 400 airplanes uh, going one-way ticket, just attacking uh, the United States, uh, it, it, the US had to develop uh, the dirty bomb and they had to drop it approximately four years after Pearl Harbor attack, wiping out Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Oh, that was very, very ugly. But you know what was the outcome? The war ended. Mm -hmm. So uh, in war, people die. And we need to stop thinking, you know, so what to do? If Hamas is using human shields, and this means that we have a premature ceasefire, uh, then what about tomorrow? And what type of model we are giving to the rest of terrorist organizations, uh, other Islamists and other criminal groups who would have just more lust for for blood and uh, and destruction. So we cannot do this. We have to eradicate Hamas. 
And of course, uh, it's a very sad uh, reality. Uh, can I be emotional about it? Can I connect emotionally to it? I am not sure. I, I was very emotional about the Thai workers, a lot more than the civilians who died in Gaza. This is very strange. Like I never shed a tear on the children dying in Gaza. And that sounds awful, but you can judge whatever you want. But when I thought about the 23 Thai workers who had nothing to do in this shit, I wept an entire day, nonstop. I could not ex explain myself or believe myself because the Thai people were the nicest people in the world. They're just Thai workers got caught up in this fire and I could not imagine them in tunnels under the, uh, the Gaza city. Think about the infants who were kidnapped and the mother that was just so uh, defenseless, carrying her two babies, you know, in the hands of, uh, in the face of savages. So it's really not measured by how, about how many civilians die in here and how many civilians die in there. And if, uh, it's, uh, it's not about uh, scaling death here and there. It's why people died on October 7th, what really defined the problem why and how uh, in comparison to why and how uh, on the Gazan side. You bring up some some really amazing points. And I appreciate you explaining all of that because it, it does make a lot of sense. I, I I hear a lot of people talking about proportion, proportionate response. And, you know, I, I think back to World War II, like you spoke about Pearl, Har Pearl Harbor. And it makes me think about the when there was the Blitz and the bombing on London. In London, there were there were about like seventy thousand civilians who were killed by Germany, whereas uh, there were several million German civilians who were killed uh, by Allied bombing. And it's one of those things that you don't really hear people talking about it. They don't talk about proportion when it comes to that. They don't talk. Well, they shouldn't have done that. It's and the point you bring up, which I think is so important, which is why. Why did Germany bomb London versus why did London retaliate? And uh, yes. I think it, it makes a lot of sense when you frame it like that. Now, I have three unbelievably loaded questions for you. Uh, these are very loaded questions. We're, we're now going to move on to Israel. Um, and and I, I want your thoughts on this. So um, I'm going to ask them all at the same time, and then you can answer them however you see fit. Uh, number one. Is Israel illegally occupying Gaza and the West Bank? Number two, is there actually an apartheid in Israel? Uh, slash, is Israel committing a genocide against the Palestinian people? And number three, does Israel have a right to exist? And I can repeat them all if you'd like. Um. I mean, I don't see them as loaded questions. There are very simple facts on the ground. You know, first of all, the establishment of the state of Israel came under the British mandate, which was a superpower uh, controlling that territory. Prior to the uh, British, there were the Ottoman Empire. Prior to that, there was the uh, Arabs, uh, Turks, uh, Muslims, uh, Byzantines, uh, uh, Romans, all type of people walked throughout this region. It's the gate that is connecting uh, continents. Uh, and many traders, many forces came in there. And prior to that, you know, of course, was not only one uh, Jewish kingdom, but we had uh, more than one Jewish kingdom uh, in the uh, kingdoms in that territory. So it's always changing. There was no such a thing as, you know, from the beginning of existence that there was, let's say, for example, a Palestine and uh, those invaders came to Palestine. There was no such a thing as Palestine. There is still no such a thing as Palestine. It's just a broad term, a cause that infinite forces of existence have been hijacking this hypothetical thing called Palestine, pushing their agendas from the East and the West. And people continue to believe in this. But prior to say to the establishment of the state of Israel, there were for sure the British, the British, and uh, it was uh, part of Sykes Pico uh, agreement between France and Britain to divide the land, and uh, they gave some to Jordan, they gave uh, other part to the Jewish people, 
uh, and it was the Belfort uh, promise. Uh, based on that promise, uh, many Jews after World War II and after the atrocities of the Holocaust began, began to migrate legally uh, with documents to that territory under the British mandate. And this is basically like in a simple history background of how the state of Israel came about. Uh, then the establishment of Israel happened, the Arabs went outrageous and they said, this is our holy land and we cannot give it specially to the Jews. Uh, I don't know whether if Israel saw that uh, coming or not, um, Israel fought for itself and this is no, this is, uh, we are building our country here, into the story. We are not going to relocate again. Uh, we, we had enough at the Holocaust, we came here as legal under the British mandate, finish end of the story. You know, it's uh, some tribes saying that this is our land and you are invading our land, uh, go take it from the British. Um, so the Arabs refused completely to coexist with this new born state, uh, even though the international community, including Great Britain, gave the Arabs the opportunity to establish an Arab state side by side the state of Israel even though the land is very small. But the Arabs refused and they insisted on annihilating the state of Israel. It took them many years when they came back in 1967 to destroy the state of Israel. Uh, Israel was extremely outnumbered. A majority of Arab countries participated in that. Many volunteers were talking about Israel was outnumbered a dozen times, something like that. But the Arabs lost the war. Somehow they lost the war. And as an outcome of the 1967 war, miraculously, Israel uh, uh, controlled the territory where the United Nations and the international community uh, proposed a potential Arab state next to the state of Israel. And that was the West Bank, Golan Heights, Sinai, Gaza. So the Arab lost this land as outcome of the war that Israel did not intentionally wanted to expand territory. It just the war happened in this region. And as Israel has defended itself against the Arab invasion, uh, they took control of the land. So tell me, who has the right to actually write the terms uh, uh, to the other, the victor or the defeated? You, the Arabs did not accept the two-state solution back in 1947, 1948. So they wanted violence. They wanted by the means of violence. No, first we destroy Israel, then we build an Arab state. That was their condition. This is why they lost the war and this is why they lost territory. But then if the Arabs just realized that victors only write history, only the victor, not the defeated, this is how it goes. But they don't want to accept this truth. And they keep trying to write the terms to Israel. It didn't work. And this last war in Gaza, just another example. Israel withdrew from Gaza, but Hamas launched the war. And now the scenario is repeating itself. What Israel would do in case they win the war against Hamas? Who will write the future? Who will decide to the other? the victor or the defeated. This is why the Arabs haven't learned, you know, and uh, again, it's very hard to say because, you know, I left the region so many years. I would say Arabs, like, because uh, I don't know if it was a matter of blood, my blood is Arab, but uh, it has been so many years that I dropped all this idea of nationalism and all this type of absurd uh, beliefs uh, and stupidity that I, I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm uh, I belong to a different universe. It's not even Earth. Uh, but anyway, if I had to descend and go to that mentality, we're very arrogant people. And we don't accept defeat. And every time we are defeated, but we try to pose as we are victorious, like somebody get beaten up so badly, but then shake up the dust and pretend that, uh, that they were the, the victor in the thing. It's a very uh, arrogant uh, mentality that is uh, 
uh, is stuck in a vicious cycle of pride, of shame, of guilt, a uh, very low level of consciousness. And uh, they haven't grown up uh, out of it. And I, I really would love for them to just grow up and forget about the political border and see Israel for what it is. Israel is not an apartheid state because when you go to the state of Israel, you have all type of uh, ethnicities, especially minorities uh, like Christians, uh, uh, Druze, uh, Muslims, uh, Arabic in Israel is an official language. <laughs> um, and uh, it's even before English. There is uh, Hebrew, there is Arabic, then there is English uh, in the state of Israel. You have representatives of uh, the Arab communities within the Israeli parliament, within the Israeli Knesset. Uh, the Arabs are very important uh, part of the social uh, fabric, the Israeli social fabric. Uh, they play a significant role uh, in security uh, and many other departments. Um, uh, there are many of them doctors and uh, they just work side by side. It's, they're a very important part of the uh, state of Israel. And uh, they are not small. We're talking about 1.5 million. Arabs. And if you go to, the, to this uh, Arab minority in Israel, tell them, hey, would you drop your Israeli citizenship and go to any Arab country? They will kill you. <laughs> it's as simple as that. They won't trade it for anything. And by the way, many of the Palestinians, it's their dream, actually, to become Israeli citizens, including Hamas leaders. You would find very long lines trying <laughs> to get a, a permanent residency in Israel which was fascinating for me. You know, you hate Israel so much, but all of you want to live in Israel. All of you <laughs> want to work in Israel. Uh, so we have um, this type of uh, self-delusion and uh, deception uh, lie uh, uh, up upon lie. And uh, Israel cannot be an apartheid state, not like this. Of course, you find some racist people, close-minded people, fanatics. They are everywhere, but they're not majority. And when they surface, uh, the collective consciousness of the Jewish people reject that, reject this type of extreme uh, mm. extremists. Uh, we saw how uh, Israel demonstrate uh, their uh, democracy continuously, could go for eternity uh, and in a peaceful manner. When, when they see some extremes, uh, extreme forces rising uh, within the society. It's a very beautiful nation, uh, real, real people. It cannot be, uh, you will never find uh, abuse against uh, Arab workers who work there on a regular basis, coming by the way from Gaza, where Israel allowed tens of thousands of workers just the eve of October 7 attack. You know, they were just easing it on the Gazan people, bringing them, giving them work permit to come work and go back to their homes at uh, in the evening to help the Palestinian economy. Because Israel felt the responsibility. We, we have to help rejuvenate their economy under the siege, hoping that things would change uh, for, for better. So uh, taking those workers, uh, you will not. See, they have all the rights in the world as as uh, uh, manpower, uh, laborers, etc. You see, it's on a regular basis. Israel dealing with hundreds of thousands of uh, Arab laborers in its uh, state. So, for those who say Israel is an apartheid state, uh, they just uh, really want to accuse and condemn Israel for I don't know whatever motive they have. Mostly hatred, I think. Mostly hatred. Uh, what was the third question? The third yeah, one the was, thing. does Israel have a right to exist? Whoa. <laughs> and uh, who am I to decide this? <laughs> <laughs> uh, who am I? No one has the right to decide or uh, to uh, validate Israel or to cancel Israel. No one. Mm. Uh, no authority. Not the United Nations, not the United States. The greatest ally has the right to decide the, the fate of Israel by saying, you know, today you have the right to exist, tomorrow maybe some of the pro-Palestine group will take over the American politics and then they can decide mm. uh, the annihilation of the state of Israel. Uh, this is not a matter of opinion. It's uh, reality on the ground. 
why uh, i personally don't like to go uh the root of okay historic religious uh, connection to the land the holy land etc okay this is a great dream and israel is not lying when they say this they have their roots they have their heritage they have all the evidence in the world that they existed there throughout the centuries and even prior to the ex uh, establishment of the state of israel the jewish communities maintained presence there on the soil as the powers kept changing from Roman to Byzantine to Muslim. The Jewish communities were there throughout centuries. Uh, but what's really more important uh, nowadays? And this is the way I prefer to look at it. We have 10 million, close to 10 million citizens of the state of Israel that they were born in that land. If you are born in that land, then you have the birthright to that land. This is a universal rule. It's beyond any politics, beyond any religion, beyond any history. It doesn't matter the ancestors. It doesn't matter who uh, was there 100 years ago or even 10,000 years ago. What really matters is that I was born in this land. I have the birthright to be here. Mm. And this is the end of the story. This is what really defines Israel. So uh, all the chaos that this is my land, this is my grandfather's land, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's whether your land or it's not. Don't tell me my grand grand grandfather was in this land and I want the Turks also can case, they say the same thing. Right. Uh, so Israel was established as a legal uh, state uh, by the authority of the land. Uh, they have historic connection, they have religious connection, spiritual connection to the land, but more importantly, it's their birthright to be there and no one has the authority uh, to uh, force them, relocate, or to even dare to annihilate them. If they are trying to do this means that uh, we will turn the globe into, uh, into chaos and we will never end this vicious cycle of violence. Mm. You know, one thing I hear a lot of the very like anti-Israel crowd, one thing they'll say is they'll say two things that are they can't exist simultaneously. On one hand, they'll say Israel has one of the most powerful militaries in the world. And then on the other hand, they'll say that Israel is trying to commit a genocide against the Palestinian people, which to me doesn't make sense because if Israel has a very strong military, which they do, then they could wipe every Palestinian off the face of the earth, or especially in Gaza and the West Bank, in, an, I don't know, an hour, I would imagine. So do you think Israel is trying to commit a genocide against Palestinians? Are they actively and deliberately committing war, uh, war crimes against Palestinians? Uh, what do you think about that? Oh, this is absurd. Or... <laughs> And this is the uh, pro-Palestine uh, propaganda. Uh, Israel is the most accountable state when it comes to morality. Their morality is beyond uh, just a political uh, regime. Uh, the morality of the Jewish people, such a heritage, uh, advanced consciousness that has contributed to life in every field, in every aspect of life, how can we be so blind? Just look at the contribution of Jewish people and their attitude towards life, wherever they are, uh, the most peaceful uh, people. So Israel is just uh, an extension of this mentality that believes in, uh, uh, we depend on each other. Uh, and uh, to, uh, accuse Israel of genocide, especially when Israel is the only victim of a genocide, and then strip them their right to, to defend themselves. I don't want to say to offer them help as, uh, as we already experienced in the past century what happened and the hatred towards uh, Jews and uh, what some, some of us are capable of doing uh, and we all say it and we sang throughout the years, never again, never again. And now it's happening right uh, in front of our eyes. And uh, now we, f uh, we fail again uh, morally. 
um, so instead of giving hand to Israel in their fight against simply savages, savages, it's not that Israel is fighting against a nation or against people. Israel is fighting against savages. So what we do, we don't allow them to defend themselves. We don't help them. And we condemn them while the predator, the savages, get away. And we are trying so hard to give the savages a lifeline. Uh, this is how we are inflicting more pain on Israel as they, they are mourning uh, this uh, atrocity. Uh, so accusing Israel of being a genocide is a lie, is baseless. None of those have the mean to support it. And if they're just using some photos coming from Syria from many years ago and say, this is Gaza, look what Israel is doing in Gaza. Okay, we see the destruction of buildings. Uh, and um, uh, I don't want to say all, but let's say at least most of those buildings, they received phone calls to evacuate. Uh, unless if it, if it was a direct target, a Hamas top leader, and the decision was, kill him, he has his tribe surrounding him, his tribe is part of his process. I don't think, I think it's totally justified. Uh, if as long as this member or this leader of Hamas want to survive, uh, is going to survive and carry more attacks and cause more trouble, then it's the necessary evil. And this is what happened in war. People die. But I cannot say that this is a genocide. The genocide is a completely different story. What happened on October 7th is a genocide. The, that's a clear case of a genocide. So why twist it? You know, those people who, uh, uh, I don't know, it's such a twisted reality, you know, twisted people, uh, but they don't change the truth on the ground. Whatever it is, sooner or later, the truth of October 7 will be revealed to the world and the truth of Gaza also will be revealed to the world. And I hope it will be a world that does not have Hamas in it. One thing you, you brought up a couple of times now, and I would like to just ask for clarification because I don't think many people have thought about this. Um, obviously, there are innocent civilians who are dying in, in Gaza, uh, but you've mentioned pictures out of Syria. And, and I actually, I saw something, uh, I saw... Something from the, whether it was from Hamas or uh, some type of propaganda, they sh they showed a picture of all of the Palestinian, a bunch of the Palestinian children who've been killed, but it actually turned out a bunch of the pictures were actually Israeli children who had been killed uh, on October 7th. Uh, are you saying that Hamas propaganda are using pictures and videos from catastrophes in other countries like Syria? to pretend as though the, the devastation in Gaza is worse than it actually is? Of course, they have been magnifying. They want, because this is how they win the war. They, they, they have experience. They've done it four times in a row. And they know that the weak uh, point uh, in the free world that we cannot tolerate civilian casualties of this magnitude. So the more you uh, magnify it, amplify it, uh, the better. Then you have also not only Hamas, because Hamas is busy killing their own people and Hamas is busy killing Israelis. But you'll have the uh, instruments in the hands of Hamas, uh, which is the pro-Palestine movement on campuses. Whatever that is... Uh, satisfying their uh, self-righteousness through representing the atrocities and the evil Israel to the world, because this is how they validate themselves, by spreading all type of lies. And yes, it can be all photoshopped. It can be, it's all fake. And uh, in principle, even if it was real, the way they represent the truth uh, is uh, through falsehood, because they aim to uh, delegitimize the only democratic state in the region in favor of savages. So this is the fundamental uh, lie based on their uh, distorted intention that is not pure. 
that is not actually looking for justice as much as looking for making a point at the expense of children dying and not thinking about the next generation because the same pro-Palestine movement, this is what they did in the first war, in the second war, in the third war. Every time they came so fast for Hamas rescue and they gave Hamas a lifeline so fast. Everybody came begging for a ceasefire and Israel listened to them. The first time, the second time, the third time, the fourth time, and the fifth war. And where are we at right now? And now Israel supposed to listen to them again, to bend to their demand. So Hamas can take everybody into this rabbit hole uh, for an endless prisoner exchange uh, to release thousands of mass murderers back to the street. So the next attack, the next war would be 10 times worse. So even though we see death among civilians today, I say, but we have no other choice. We have to finish Hamas this war. We have to finish them this time in order to avoid such catastrophe in the past. And I am sure post-war, we will do everything, whatever it takes, to uh, rebuild Gaza, to help the people, uh, and uh, people will uh, will heal with time. But we have to set the process on the right foundations. We cannot just propose, for example, a Palestinian state, which many people think, oh, a Palestinian state, just give them a state, let's get done with this. And who is going to rule this state? Savages? Yeah, they just just a very simple question. Now, before we propose a state, who would be the ruler? And before we propose a state, do we have a nation to begin with? I want to see effort that is uh, aiming to build a Palestinian nation. What do I want to do with a state if there is no nation, if there is no infrastructure, if there is no... Uh, uh, foundation of such a nation. But most politicians, they want the prestige and the uh, privileges that come with a state. And they don't want the responsibility that comes with a nation. In order to build a nation, you need selfless leadership that give the people everything they have. Knowledge, wisdom, education, economy, good plan, uh, and they drop their personal interest so the nation can grow. Well, we are dealing with predators, criminals, who have been bleeding the nation, gambling with children's blood. This is what Hamas did on October 7th. They are gambling with Gaza children's blood to achieve power, territory, money, prestige. So it's the opposite. So why do I want to give a state to the, such leaderships, whether if it was uh, Yasser Arafat uh, and other many groups that includes Hamas, all of them play in the same game. They profit out of this conflict. And we have to cut this, uh, this, uh, uh, this lifeline that they have. It's their game. The equation uh, of um, blood for money shed blood whenever they run out of money and they want to uh, stimulate economy, they shed blood. As strange as it sounds, this is how it is. So this has to come to an end. And this is why I'm, uh, you probably hear me many other places very emotional about it and screaming out loud, uh, coming across as a madman. And now I really don't care anymore you know, what people think of me. It is what it is. The situation just made me the way I am. And we have to express it in every possible way because building bridges of understanding, uh, we will stop uh, empowering the predator against the prey. And I don't care about the Palestinian state. I don't want a Palestinian state. I care that we give the new generation of Arabs who live in that region, if they choose to live peacefully next to the state of Israel, that we give them economy, we give them education, uh, we open bridges between them and the rest of the world, uh, we integrate them uh, into a higher society. I'm pro all that. 
but do I want to give an army and guns and power and more money to a bunch of corrupt leadership? Hell no, it's not going to happen. I am going to fight it, even for eternity, that whenever this type of criminals try to take advantage of the situation anymore, we will have to stop them. Especially no American taxpayer money anymore to any Palestinian entity that does not respect and accept Israel, Israel's right to exist in that region. As long as they don't accept it as reality, as reality protected by earth, protected by heaven, that this amazing group of people have the right to live in this land, the birthright to live in it. As long as they don't have this, they don't admit it, no money, no funding, no support, not even recognition of anything. You know, I, I, I appreciate your passion for this. And I, one of the reasons I, I have been so excited to speak with you is because to my knowledge, you're the only person in the world who's able to speak, who really understands both sides in such a unique way. Um, I, I don't know of anyone else who's had the experiences that you've had on both sides of the, of the coin to be able to speak about it with such knowledge. Um, I have a few more questions if that's okay with you. Um, so, um, one of the questions that I have is, uh, I think specifically in relation to the West, the wet people who are brought up in Western cultures, I feel like often just for whatever reason, believe everybody thinks the way that they think. And I was wondering if you can explain for those of those of us who have been brought up in the West, um, and may not understand the mindset and the culture of those in Hamas. Um, can you, like, why do so many support it? Uh, and do you think they actually know or understand what they're supporting in the West? Like, do you think the people who support Hamas, who are who are uh, parading for Hamas, uh, do you think they actually know what they're supporting? Do you think they understand what what is what they're speaking for and what they're trying to accomplish? Do you think they understand what's going on? Um, you know, here in the West, we believe in diversity and uh, diversity is power. Many uh, ethnicities migrated to the United States and this is what makes the United States uh, a great country. Uh, and I am pro that, uh, but this, uh, comes to an end when we have a minority that adapts uh, violence as, as a mean to achieve uh, whatever tribal agenda they have or uh, social agendas they have. So this is, I think, where uh, democracy uh, uh, cannot compromise. So this is a situation that, of course, uh, everybody has their own, well, people say that everyone has their own truth, but I say, no, there is nothing but the truth. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, 7 billion people have their own version of that truth. 7 billion people have, or 8 billion people, whatever it is, they have uh, their unique uh, perceptual ability and differentiates between someone with uh, there are the unconscious, there is the conscious, uh, and there are people with super consciousness. Uh, even though we all walk on two legs and uh, we have many things in common, but some of us carry uh, different abilities and different uh, uh, power to see things for what they are. And some of us don't see anything for what it is. So uh, I would say rather than everybody is living their, their own truth, uh, everyone is uh, living their own reality. Mm. Uh, and they, it could be uh, walking according truth according evolution, or it could be going in the opposite direction to evolution. Uh, let's say in many cases against the grand design 
of the universe because the universe works according perfect order. Uh, the solar system works according perfect order. And if anything in it is not in balance, uh, then it would be total destruction. Uh, even though we could be heading towards that destruction. I don't know all the um, uh, conceptions of time and space and truth and uh, mind, uh, consciousness, uh, but the end of the day, uh, this diversity, what makes us uh, beautiful and what makes life amazing and colorful. Uh, but then uh, uh, violence uh, is at the end. Because in violence, uh, if it's not contained, this means could be the annihilation and the destruction of mankind. Um, so I built something. I deconstruct it. This is my, uh, the two forces that I, uh, let's say, juggle with on a regular basis. Uh, there is an extreme, uh, the rise extreme. I uh, counter it with another extreme. Then the two extremes uh, clash. Uh, I make them clash to the point of uh, where is equilibrium. A state of balance and this is how creation happens uh, usually between two uh, extremes uh, so creation and destruction is part of life but those who have the authority uh, to deconstruct the creative process for the purpose of creation it's not for uh, because of hatred uh, and uh, when we have uh, people who actually haven't created but now they think they have the authority to destroy what other people created. And that's the only thing they know how to do. Then uh, that's not allowed. That's really going against evolution now. And uh, the evolution, especially of mankind, not, not the evolution of the universe only. So with that said, uh, many people have the idea, yes, the diversity, all the opinions and the sexual orientation and the religions, and it just have everybody in this big pot. It's going to taste uh, amazing afterwards for everyone. Okay, it's a beautiful world. But in reality, you know, there are natural laws and there are universal laws uh, that are superior to man-made laws. So it doesn't matter, you know, who is the philosopher that they supposed to agree with or disagree with, uh, the cosmic laws will always be superior to man-made uh, uh, laws and ideas. So I don't know if I answered your question. No, that was super insightful. You might be able to hear my daughter in the background. She might have, uh, she might have just woken up for nap. Um, two more questions, two more. Um, I, I know we've already almost an hour and a half and I want to be respectful of your time. Um, number one, what is the resolution to all of this in your mind? Uh, and is a two-state solution possible or even desirable? I addressed the two-state solution. I told you, you know, first of all, we need to, uh, to finish savages. Uh, we need to get them out of the picture. And this mm -hmm. time, uh, there is no compromise. There is no way around it. Um, so we have to finish this task first. Then after that, hopefully it will not come at a very high price because uh, if this is going to ignite uh, a regional war eventually, which I hope that will not happen and we can just uh, finish the war in Gaza and in Gaza only, even though the global security and the global... Uh, uh, we have many, many global problems happening simultaneously. Uh, as this war uh, manifests, uh, we have many challenges. And uh, of course, people now think that the a Palestinian state would solve the human condition and would solve uh, the global security issue, but I don't think so. Uh, if it's not done on the right foundations uh, where all sides agree and reach the, the realization that peace is the only way. It's not enough for Israel to believe in peace with the Arab world. We need a majority of the Arab world to come to the conclusion that violence is a dead end, at least before we get to the point 
talking about peace and two-state solution. And I think this is what Israel is determined to do this time, to show all Islamists and all fanatics, especially savages. We have savages among us. It's the 21st century and we're dealing with this barbaric group. So we will have to deal with them. There is no escape. The moment we eradicate them, then we prove them wrong. By doing so, and this is my positive, let's say, view, the best case scenario, we have eradicated the Muslim Brotherhood and we brought their uh, ideology uh, to ashes because their model, their attempt, the momentum that they have uh, established or built for uh, about 35 years through Hamas, such a great investment, uh, and the peak of it, uh, was October 7. Yes, it hurt Israel very much. Many civilians died, but we can prove to the Muslim Brotherhood that this was a dead end. By doing so, we also proved to Hezbollah, to uh, the drug cartels, to uh, many other terrorist groups, criminal groups, that you cannot bend a democracy. You uh, cannot... Uh, uh, violence is not superior to dialogue. It's as simple as this. So this is the message. If we finish with this task successfully without igniting a regional war in the Middle East, then bravo. Good job, Israel. Good job, the United States and all those who are taking the side of democracy in this ugly war against savages. Uh, but things could get uh, uglier. And if they get uglier and uh, we have a regional war, then it could be World War Three. Uh, then uh, who is concerned of what state? Because everything is going to be history. Scary, uh, but it makes total sense. And uh, Musab, uh, last question. Yeah. For everyone listening, for all of the, the people out there who don't know what to do, they don't, they're just regular people living their lives in the United States and in Canada and the United Kingdom and Australia and in the Middle East and everywhere. What can they do or what would you recommend they do in order to um, move towards peace, in order to make the world a better place, in order to move towards peace to a, a, a good outcome? What's your recommendation for everyone listening? Well, I, I think all those who don't have uh, anything to do with this conflict, they should spend their day, you know, practicing yoga, working out, getting healthy, <laughs> eating healthy, uh, and uh, paying more attention to breathing and less of mind and uh, less involvement with things that we don't understand. Yeah, I'm, I'm involved in this shit because <laughs> I had no other choice. Uh, prior to this war, you know, I was just free diving. I was uh, practicing <laughs> yoga. I was just enjoying an amazing, simple life, by the way. It was not a big life, and I did not want a big life. I just wanted uh, uh, to be in nature, sit under a waterfall for a long, as long as it takes until I black out. <laughs> uh, th those are the things that I enjoyed uh, very much. Uh, so, yes, you know, the, the people, uh, we need to uh, levitate the uh, consciousness. And uh, as some of us sink uh, in this uh, black hole of hatred, uh, at least some of us need to uh, maintain uh, health, uh, clarity, power. Uh, some of us are involved in war now, like myself. I'm at the center of this human chaos, uh, cut up, totally cut up in the web. And I cannot believe myself that, uh, you know, looking back just two or three years ago, I thought I was completely out of the mess. <laughs> and now I'm just uh, in the web. So at least some of us now in Gaza fighting, some of us are fighting the good fight everywhere. Uh, the rest, uh, we, we need the creative people to continue creating, uh, keeping order, keeping innovation. Uh, and uh, of course, I'm not saying to disconnect from the situation, but everyone should focus on their task. Well, that could not have been a more perfect ending. You know, I'm a 
I'm just a fitness guy. I'm a strength coach and nutrition coach. And so maybe one day I'd love to have you on the podcast to talk about your, your lifestyle, your health, your fitness and yoga and all. I would love to learn more about that. Um, but Great. Musab, I, uh, I, again, I appreciate you more than I can begin to express. I admire you greatly. Um, is there any, I, I want everyone to go get Son of Hamas to read your your story and to learn uh, the deeper backstory of you. Uh, is there anything that you would like to tell people to get of yours or to watch of yours, uh, to follow you somewhere, maybe on X? Is there any of that? Um, so I have new projects that are coming on the horizon. Some of them are like... Uh, it's the uh, fruit of my work many, many years, 10 years in the uh, making, but I cannot reveal them now. Uh, Son of Hamas is a good start. I, I hate to promote. I, I, I never promote my book anyway. Uh, and I had so many media interviews, etc. cetera. I, I forget that there is a book out there, but I think it can give people some knowledge of the region, what's going on. Um, and yes, I'm, I'm building momentum on X. I just joined uh, X uh, less, it's about like a month ago, and we have close to 70,000 followers. Uh, so this is allowing me to communicate with people. I did not have social media uh, for six or seven years, not even a Facebook, up to just <laughs> uh, a month ago. Uh, I just did not want to be part of the social media. But a month ago, it just became very important that I come back and share with people some thoughts, some philosophy, some facts on the ground, analysis. Uh, I like to keep my uh, followers informed. I don't use the platform to advance uh, any product there. Uh, I uh, simply have, I follow zero. Uh, and I just keep it, <laughs> and I just keep it. I keep it uh, authentic, as authentic as possible. So if somebody uh, want to hear more updates on the Middle East, uh, and uh, at some point, hopefully, I can take this entire chaos, then I can share with people the things that more important things I learned about the self, about how the body works, how the mind works, uh, about breathing and movement. Uh, the, the more important stuff, uh, the tools that actually every individual needs. But right now, I'm in the midst of a chaos. I'm uh, only talking politics, etc. But yes, if somebody like to follow me uh, anywhere, uh, I'll, uh, uh, I'll I'll do my best to keep them informed on the uh, current uh, developments. I, I love following you on X. You're incredibly articulate and very helpful. So. Thank you for everything you do there. And, and again, Musab, thank you so much. I, I sincerely appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very much.